Seth, when you're outside this wonderful quantum computing lab and thinking about uh, reality uh, and uh, what you really believe, what are the kinds of questions that you, uh, that you really ask yourself and really wonder about? So I've always, uh, uh, ever since I was a little kid, I've always been interested in what made the universe tick. Uh, um, I was really, that's why when I first studied physics um, in, I guess, in junior high school or something like that, I was really excited because here was this science that supposedly applied to everything, was extremely fundamental, told you everything that went on at its most fundamental levels, and it was simple, and it gave you the hope of understanding everything that was going right, on. Right. And then, of course, you know, I, I majored in physics and then I, I went to graduate school and I realized what a load of hooey that was. <laughs> in fact, that, that this was just a kind of propaganda to get smart people to study physics. In fact, people knew almost nothing of what was going on. The amount of knowledge of what was going on was incredibly tiny compared with the vast ignorance about what was actually happening. And it wasn't at all like, you know, this beautiful, moving, this elegant world of platonic objects. It was like floundering around in a tsunami, right? So, so in fact, it was, a, I was a little disappointed when I found out about that, but I still managed to soldier on. And so the, the kinds of problems that I thought would be interesting to look at are, well, I mean, I guess I, was always driven by my own ignorance and being baffled by mm. what's going on. So, so the reason I started to study questions of quantum mechanics and information uh, was that when I first took quantum mechanics um, from Norman Ramsey at Harvard, um, I really didn't understand it. It was like weird. I mean, here's the stuff like electron can be here and there at the same time. Like who ordered that? Right? <laughs> Bizarre. And I never could get it under my skin why things work this way. It always irked me. So when I was a graduate student, I was at Cambridge University and I'd, I'd done part three maths, kind of a, a uh, uh, master's degree in physics, quantum gravity, elementary particle physics. And I had another year on my Marshall Scholarship, and I decided that I would study philosophy of science, mm. history and philosophy of science, focusing on quantum mechanics and ideas of information with the hope that somehow, somewhere, by actually looking at the history of how these ideas worked and by looking at how one might fit them together with ideas about information, that I might be able to make some sense of this weird stuff they call yeah. quantum mechanics. <laughs> And ironically, even though you know that was a degree in history and philosophy, is my only degree in humanities. Uh, uh, that's what I do now. Right? So I started working on ideas of, of of information and quantum mechanics. I realized that we could make some sense out of this quantum weirdness by looking at ideas of quantum mechanics and information. And then later on, I I, I looked at ideas of complexity, like one of the the biggest questions. Well, I think questions like famous questions like how do you make a quantum theory of gravity those are very important things to resolve sure. though of course my own theory about this is that we shouldn't quantize gravity let's not go down that route and see what happens right but <clears throat> then then um the question of why the universe is complex i feel that uh that's a very important question to understand something that's very mysterious and uh the way to understand this is to look at how physical systems register and process information. How so, is it so, they so you see information, particularly quantum information, this new area of, uh, of thought as well as research, as a vehicle to understand some of these large questions about reality, whether it's the nature of complexity or quantum gravity or even the structure of life itself? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think now, of course, um, I, I think information has been given, not given enough time on the physical stage. I mean, energy is always the quantity yes, that people yes, have talked right. about, where the first law of thermodynamics says energy is conserved, sure, right? Yeah. The second law of thermodynamics is about information or entropy. Entropy is a form of information. Entropy is bits of information that are carried around by atoms and molecules as they bounce off of each other. A test of order and disorder. Right, that's right. So, so second law says entropy tends to increase. And, and entropy you can think of as, as random information. It's yeah. information that's random. And the second law says random information tends to increase. And things get more and more random. Yeah, so, so, so the, the information has always played second fiddle <laughs> to energy in uh, uh, the uh, laws of physics. And I feel it's time for a change. 
So you, you then would see, as time goes on, some of these big questions that uh, the nature of information can be not just ways of representing these questions in some, uh, in some language, but really being helpful theoretically to actually understand them. I hope so. Right. For instance, I think that, that uh, we're not going to understand enough about quantum mechanics to get a good quantum mechanical theory of gravity unless we understand how information works in a quantum mechanical mm. setting. Mm. To my mind, that's a precondition. And I suspect that most people would disagree with me about that, most string theorists and people who do quantum gravity. Right. On the other hand, empirically, it's been true so far because we don't have a good theory of quantum <laughs> gravity. <laughs> yeah, and, and I mean, of course, you know, uh, I, I'm guilty of, 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 of uh, kowtowing to the zeitgeist, right? You know, <laughs> it's like, oh, now computation and communication is very important for society. We're going to go a computational revolution. And, and hey, you know, Lloyd, I, I build, he builds quantum computers, right? So of course he thinks everything's a big, gigantic right. computer. Like, guilty is charged, right? On the other hand, uh, uh, this is not a metaphor. Right? It's not a metaphor that things are computing. And in fact, uh, when Maxwell, Boltzmann, and Gibbs, the great statistical mechanicians, figured out that entropy was information back at the end of the 19th century, they certainly weren't guilty of, you know, of looking and seeing all these computers around and saying everything was a computer. They figured out on their own that, you know, that every atom carries bits. Every time two atoms collide, those bits flip. So the very first, uh, very first use of information in physics had nothing to do with, with, with computation. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so I want, I want to restore information to its rightful place here. I don't think it should just be energy hogging the stage <laughs> like some large soprano singing around. I want to have a duet, right? A duet between information and energy. And uh, it's really in this kind of uh, waltz that as information and energy move around the stage together in each other's arms, as it were, that's what the laws of physics really consist of.